people are still streaming in, I'm going to do a little bit of beginning stuff before we go to our speaker. I'm Mike Ehrman, chairman of this group. We've been here now almost five years, and for those of you who are new, and we always get new people, we have these lectures uh, every two, once a month, Tuesday nights. Uh, we take August off. The lectures are always free. We are a membership group. We have a little over 80 members now. I'd like to set a record this year and get over 100, so we, we urge you to take a membership form with you or to, to contribute at the end. It's $10 per basic membership. We do these lectures, and our, our next biggest activity is that twice a year in the summer we do walking tours. And we've done that now second year or third year? Third, this will be the third year. Third year. Marion Cook in the back, who also does tours for history and landmarks, but is an active member here and a resident, uh, is going to do our two tours this year. The first one is the Marfield Complex. It's Wednesday, May 21st. Uh, we'll uh, meet at Alderdice at 6.30, and then it's still light till later, 8.30. And we'll go Alderdice High School in the Marfield Complex. Might be able to get inside uh, uh, to see a unit. Then on Saturday, the 7th uh, of June, the Squirrel Hill Business District, which we have not done before. And that's going to meet right here at 10.30 for a couple of hours that Saturday. Now, these application forms are in the back. Uh, we're just starting to get sign-ups. But I will shut these off at 25 because uh, otherwise you can't hear the results. And uh, we actually have dropped the cost this year. Members, $3 per the tour, and non-members, $5. Uh, just to repeat, next month's meeting is Jim Cunningham from WQED. I'm uh, going to talk about the history of the radio station, which I think is 35 years old, and classical music in Pittsburgh. Any questions before we go to tonight's talk? Our speaker tonight is Dr. William Garrett. Uh, he was a practicing plastic surgeon and faculty member at Pitt Medicine for many years. He's in retirement. He's pursued interests in travel, gardening, and history. He's an active docent for the History and Landmarks Foundation, especially, I think, of, right on downtown tours. And some of you may have had Bill in, in, in a tour before. He's also done time at the old Allegheny County Jail Museum, which offers free tours every Monday with artifacts of 19th and 20th century, and adaption of the building in its current use is presented in the museum. Uh, Bill has studied the life of William Penn to, uh, to help out on one of the History and Landmark tours. Uh, the, uh, he's going to talk tonight about Mr. Henry Richardson, who designed the courthouse and the jail and uh, old Trinity Church in Boston, right? Uh, and other such things. There's a book by the Albert Tanner on this subject that will be selling for $5 over at that table afterwards. Thank you for coming. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Do all of you have a program? Because for the first part of this, I'm going to talk from the program. Our Transparency archives at Landmarks are not great. We have a lot of paper, but we don't have it's projectable. And so I've cobbled together some pictures that I've printed out, and I will talk from them uh, for the first, first part of this uh, uh, meeting. We are here tonight uh, for me to whet your interest in uh, this wonderful building complex that we have in Pittsburgh, the Allegheny County Courthouse and Jail, uh, really uh, landmarks of national importance. And I think I would like to begin by introducing you to Henry Hodgson Richardson so that you'll understand something more about the architect and where he was coming from. Vincent Scully, who was the Sterling Professor of History of Art at Yale, in 1955 wrote, the 1870s brought profound and sweeping changes in American architecture. From among the architects of this time, one pathfinding artistic personality emerged to whose influence the other architects of the period 
were all in one way or another subjected. This was Henry Hobson Richardson. Henry Hobson Richardson was born in St. James Parish, Louisiana, in 1838. He was born on a family sugarcane uh, plantation. He came from an interesting family that had uh, gone to Louisiana in 1803, just at the time of the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, his mother, for those of you who possibly have scientific education, his mother was a granddaughter of Joseph Priestley, one of the greatest scientists who's ever lived. He worked in the 18th century in uh, England, mostly, was the discoverer of oxygen, nitrous oxide, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, first described plant respiration, first described photosynthesis, and also was a founder of the Unitarian Church. So <laughs> Henry Hobson Richardson had uh, some good genes. <clears throat> Uh, his father was a stockbroker, and uh, he was reared uh, mainly in the city of New Orleans. Uh, uh, his father died when Richardson was 17, and his mother uh, remarried uh, soon after. But Richardson acquired a very friendly and understanding stepfather. So I think that we can say that Richardson had a very, very comfortable upbringing. When Richardson finished his secondary education in New Orleans, his family sent him north to enter West Point. Uh, Richardson got to West Point and admission was refused because he stuttered. And the authorities felt that an army officer would be disadvantaged if he stuttered. And so Richardson went on to Boston, applied to Harvard, and was admitted to Harvard with the class of 1859. Uh, Richard was, uh, Richardson was a so-so kind of student, uh, didn't excel at all, but he was an astonishing social success. Uh, everybody liked this guy. Uh, he uh, was elected to Porcellion, which is the elite Harvard club. He met lots of influential people in Boston. And I don't want to overemphasize this social aspect, but the fact that he was such a charming bon vivant vivant and was so interesting to be with was no handicap as he developed his architectural practice uh, because he knew a lot of people who were influential and rich, and this was very helpful. But aside from that, uh, Richardson really did emerge as an architectural genius. He graduated in 1859 and decided that he wanted to be an architect. Uh, at that time, there were no schools of architecture in the United States. <laughs> Uh, it's interesting that as early as 1817, Thomas Jefferson thought about establishing a school of architecture in his projected University of Virginia. He was going to make the architecture department a division of mathematics. Unfortunately, he could recruit no one for faculty, and so the project died. <clears throat> uh, and it came about then that uh, the uh, first uh, school of architecture uh, in the United States was uh, established at MIT in um, oh, 1859, I believe. And uh, then the next one at the University of Illinois in 1867 and Cornell in 1876. So academic architecture was rather slow to start in the United States. Richardson wanted an academic education, and at that time, arguably, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris was the leading world's uh, school of architecture. It had been founded in the 17th century and had uh, acquired for itself a, a very sound reputation. And Richardson enrolled. <clears throat> After graduating uh, from uh, college, he set off with a couple of friends for Europe and stopped uh, first uh, in England for a while and uh, toured a bit of England, then went on to Normandy and uh, uh, <coughs> visited there for a while, and then finally went on to Paris, where he enrolled in the Ecole. Unfortunately, <clears throat> um, the Civil War came about. <laughs> and uh, when the Civil War uh, financially distressed Richardson's affluent family, and funds were cut off. <coughs> so Richardson was stranded in Paris um, and had to make a living. <coughs> Uh, he dropped out of the Ecole, he had to for financial reasons, and sought work in a Paris architectural office. 
where he worked uh, th uh, until the end of the Civil War. Uh, I'll mention right here that Richardson was the second American to go to Paris to study architecture. Uh, the uh, first was uh, uh, a man uh, uh, who's, I will come back to him uh, in a few moments, Richard Morris Hunt. Uh, had gone to Paris and had studied the Vieco and had gotten home before the Civil War started. So Richardson was the second American who had been on this adventure. Uh, Richardson being very gregarious, even though he was working in this architectural office in Paris, uh, every evening, every weekend, he was fraternizing with the École staff and his friends there, and he continued to be very closely identified with the École, though he was not officially a student, and as far as I can tell, never uh, earned a diploma or certificate from the École. Uh, after the Civil War was over, Richardson came home uh, and settled on Staten Island and had an architectural practice in New York. Uh, he struggled for a while, and then, um, uh, in 1872, got some really nice commissions. And in 1873, got the commission for Trinity Church in Boston. Uh, Trinity Church was finished in 1877 and became quite an object of international acclaim. And from 1877 on, Richardson was frantically busy. Uh, with commissions, more commissions than he could handle. Unfortunately, his health was failing, and he died nine years later. So his career was really very, very short. He was at the peak of his career nine years and then gone. He died before the before the courthouse was completed. Uh, do any of you, you got some idea of where this guy was coming from? Uh, really a, a fascinating man, and I, uh, if you have no more questions about that, I'd like to talk something about his professional development, which I think was very interesting. And uh, we'll begin, uh, if you look at your little cobbled together brochure here on the page, it's labeled one. Uh, Richardson, when he was in England, was exposed to two uh, schools that were new to him and very interesting and made great impressions on him. The first uh, would be the Arts and Crafts School, and a picture of an Arts and Crafts house is a top one on this page. Now, I don't think that Richardson ever saw this particular house, but I'm just throwing you that picture to refresh your mind about the Arts and Crafts movement. And I'll try to define it for you, and I've cobbled this definition together from several sources, and just say that the arts and crafts movement originated in England in the mid-19th century as a reaction against poor quality, mass-produced goods. It conceived of craft and decoration as a single entity in the handcrafting of both utilitarian and decorative objects. It had great appeal to Richardson because it used vernacular materials, simple designs, employed excellent craftsmen, and uh, uh, de uh, produced goods and buildings uh, with a human scale. This was, this was very warm and folksy. Uh, in the United States, out of this school uh, developed, of course, Stickney Furniture that you're all familiar with, I suppose. It was made up here in, Baltimore, in uh, Buffalo. The mission style in the southwest of the United States is a derivative of the arts and crafts movement. So uh, Richardson liked this uh, simple design and fine qualities and human scale. He also made an acquaintance then at that time with the Queen Anne style. And the two bottom pictures here show you uh, a, a nice uh, Queen Anne house divided, designed by Richard uh, Norman Shaw. Uh, a leading architect in England at the time uh, uh, Richardson was visiting. Now, Richardson never saw this house because it was finished a couple of years after uh, Richardson visited, but Richardson was familiar with uh, Shaw's work, and uh, this uh, style of architecture made a great impression upon him, and I'll try to define the Queen Anne style for you. 
Uh, it began probably as kind of a revival of the 18th century style of, that developed under the reign, during the reign of Queen Anne. But after a while, the 19th century style developed a soul of its own and came to have very little relationship to the 18th century style. So the name is very unfortunate. The Queen Anne style of the 19th century really has very little to do with the 18th century styles uh, that emerged during the reign of Queen Anne. But uh, the Queen Anne style uh, combined free asymmetric planning, and you can see this house certainly is asymmetric, vernacular building materials, particularly brick, but also timber and tile hanging. When you look at this uh, house uh, in the top picture, you'll see that the second floor and the gables are shingled. Now, in England, they didn't have nice cedar. Uh, yes? What do you mean by vernacular materials? Oh, oh um, commonplace. Common, commonplace materials that everybody used. Uh, not special things, not exotic marbles and that kind of stuff. Uh, England did not have the cedars uh, that we have for nice wood shingles. And so in England, uh, instead of having wood shingles, they used tile shingles. And they call what they do tile hanging. Uh, we would call it tile shingles. But anyway, this became very popular in the Queen Anne style. Uh, some uh, uh, 8th, 17th, 18th century English architectural details were used in an eclectic fashion, and uh, even Tudor details were introduced uh, into the Queen Anne style. It was very eclectic. There was a great emphasis on its being pretty and livable, and it really did drive crazy people who were used to the more formal classic revival uh, and uh, uh, Gothic styles that were in vogue at that time. So you can see that when, uh, when Richardson was in England, he got a, a liking for commonplace materials, simple designs, superb craftsmanship. Uh, and uh, he also got a feeling uh, for um, tying his buildings into the environment. We don't see that here in the Allegheny Terrace in Jail because, of course, it's surrounded by city. But uh, Richardson's buildings uh, were very sympathetic uh, to the environment. He was very in advance of his time in this regard. Uh, <clears throat> Richardson was never uh, uh, a uh, rebel, uh, and he, uh, he uh, kind of adapted these uh, new things uh, that he found in England to his style very easily. He went on to Normandy uh, before going on to Paris. And I'll turn you, ask you to turn to the next page, the second page. And he certainly was greatly influenced by the uh, uh, abbey you see here on the left uh, at Caen, which uh, dates to 1066. It was commissioned by William the Conqueror, and William the Conqueror was buried in this church. But Richardson was very impressed with it. And I'm going to ask you to look at it carefully because it reminds me so much of the Allegheny County Courthouse. The geometry of this building is very complicated. But you will notice that the walls are very simple and undecorated. There's not, a, there's not much added embellishment or adornment. Uh, and you will also notice that the church is uh, 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 has a lot of Romanesque rounded arches. And I'd like for you to contrast that with the building on the right, which is a French Gothic cathedral, Reims, from a couple of centuries later. And you'll see the great difference. The Gothic was in style in the mid 19th century. And you see the pointed arches, of course. But notice the elaborate decoration of this church. Everywhere you look, something is stuck on statuary and all kinds of things. It's almost like icing in a cake, on a cake, in a sense. And Richardson, again, was very impressed with the simplicity of the uh, French Romanesque. And we certainly see that in our Allegheny County Courthouse in jail. Uh, <clears throat> Richardson went on and kind of developed his own style, uh, putting all this together uh, at the Ecole. And we'll say that uh, he certainly uh, liked the simplicity. 
Open interior plans were another great thing with uh, Richardson because at the time people tended to make buildings with a lot of cut up rooms and Richardson liked the big open spaces in his interiors. Uh, he liked the rough stone, uh, the rough stone uh, in his buildings, boulders, uh, shingle surfaces, uh, uh, and uh, beautiful sculpture hardware. Uh, I want to say just a little bit about um, the Beaux-Arts style because it's important that we uh, mention that. Uh, the Ecole was very eclectic. And it uh, uh, taught uh, eclecticism, whatever. Uh, didn't emphasize any particular architectural idiom, but it did favor uh, uh, the uh, uh, Imperial Roman, Italian, and French Renaissance styles. Uh, and I'm going to ask you as I chat here to look at page three, because these are three very important Beaux-Arts buildings. They're sort of what uh, Richard was taught, uh, but did not use, did not select for himself. These are three buildings designed, houses designed for the Vanderbilt family and executed by Richard Morris Hunt, who had been Richardson's predecessor at the École de Beaux-Arts, and that's why I selected them. Uh, as you look at these pictures, I'm going to say that uh, the architecture derived from the École featured slightly overscaled details and bold sculptural embellishments. And when you look at this top picture of the breakers, yeah, that you would recognize that immediately as an Italian palazzo. And yet, when you look at it, you think, well, when I were in Rome and in Florence and Genoa, you know, you don't see anything quite like that. This is more exaggerated. It is more embellished. Uh, and this was a mark of the uh, Echo. When you look down at Biltmore, the second picture of the uh, Vanderbilt Estate in North Carolina, and you're very conscious of all of the embellishments there of uh, the French uh, chateau style. And the, uh, the, the picture below, uh, the final one to my marble house at uh, Newport, in a kind of um, classical Roman, if you will, re uh, revival, sort of like the Petit Troyen on at Versailles, really, with a portico on. But you can see the details are very bold, and you're very conscious of them. I think when you look at all these buildings, you are not at all conscious of the building material. That could be built of anything, almost. And when you look at a Richardson building, you sense his great love of building materials. And you don't sense that in these Beaux-Arts styles. That's fine. Uh, uh, Beaux-Arts uh, uh, buildings were really no noted for their impeccable craftsmanship. Now, these three buildings, I don't want to knock. I think they are an important part of our architectural heritage, but they are not Thompson <coughs> Richardson. Uh, not at all. Uh, yeah, these are, they're beautifully crafted, beautifully designed, beautifully put together, uh, but they're not what Richardson liked. Uh, the Mozart buildings were noted for grand and dramatic entrances, staircases, reception rooms. They were very concerned with good taste, and were more concerned with good taste than they were on uh, with uh, uh, concerned with innovative uh, uh, design and innovative practical designs. So this is sort of what Richardson rejected. We'll move on and uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, some things that Richardson himself did, and move on to page four here. And the first building at the top is Trinity Church in Boston, and we do have a nice color slide to show you of Trinity Church. Uh, this is perhaps one of the fussier buildings that Richardson designed, but it made his reputation because it's an astonishing beautiful church with gorgeous interiors, uh, stained glass and murals by John Lafarge, uh, a spectacular building. But when you look at its decoration and detail work, you can see that they are an intrinsic part of the fabric of the building. There is really relatively little that is added on. He used different colored stones, different, different ways of laying the stone, but there is not the add-on decoration that we, have, we see in the typical Beaux-Arts building. One of my favorite Richardson buildings is below that, uh, a house that Richardson built for Robert Treat Payne. 
Robert Treat Payne was a descendant of the Robert Treat Payne, who was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, he was a vestryman at Trinity Church. He loved working with Richardson on Trinity Church and uh, asked Richardson to design a house for him, you know, a summer house. And uh, Stonehurst, you see down there, is Richardson's contribution. And you can see this great love of the material, these boulders that he used. He really has put them together uh, absolutely gorgeously. The house sits on a rocky ledge that was worn smooth by glaciers thousands of years ago. And so all of this fits in very well. Uh, this is a very elegant house, really. The uh, interiors are, are beautiful. Uh, there, there's a lot of wood in them. You have to like oak and, and rather and that kind of woodwork. But the spaces are very uh, 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 generous and open and flowing. And there is no cut up uh, feeling at all with this house. It's interesting that the estate around the house was landscape of Frederick Law Olmsted, the architect for Central Park. So uh, Robert Treat Payne really had a, a very nice house. Uh, we'll turn the page. And uh, probably Richardson began to uh, come into prominence when he designed the Watts Sherman House in uh, Newport. And that house is pictured at the top of the page. And over here on the table, I have a book open to a colored picture of the uh, Watts Sherman House. And you can look at it and see what uh, a beautiful building it is. You can see how closely it does resemble the Shaw House that I showed you first, the example of the Queen Anne style. Uh, this is a derivative of the Queen Anne style from England, but Richardson adapted it to American conditions. He used stone for the first floor where uh, a shawl would have used brick. For the second floor, he used uh, uh, wood shingles and uh, half timbering. And uh, in the plaster work, the stucco work between it is half timbering was colored a beautiful rosy red color. That will all become apparent in the color photograph over there. Uh, but this uh, house built for a very rich man attracted a lot of attention attention. Uh, but again, it was Trinity Church that really threw uh, Richardson into international importance. I have on there a couple of other uh, pictures that I think are interesting because they show you uh, the two on the, the right. Uh, one is the gatehouse of the Ames estate, and I have a big color picture of that over here. That's this middle picture right here, which is not very flattering. Uh, the Ameses were very good friends of Richardson. I don't know whether you have ever in the hardware stores and gardening equipment run across Ames shovels and that kind of thing. Do you know that name? Get around. Well, the Ameses made shovels. They made a bucket of money in the Civil War selling shovels to the Union soldiers. And after the war, they were very shrewd businessmen. Uh, they became very involved in virtually uh, all, any business in the United States, particularly railroads. And uh, they uh, were great friends and supporters of Ames. Uh, Ames built libraries for them and churches for them and uh, they, wonderful things. But this is, the picture there is the gatehouse of their estate at northeastern Massachusetts. And I have a lovely color photograph over here you must look at to get some feeling for this perfectly gorgeous building uh, of boulders, uh, overhanging eaves, hugs the landscape, blends in with the landscape. It's a magnificent building. Uh, uh, I sh selected the picture right below here, the railroad station. One of Richardson's classmates was uh, the vice president of the Boston and Albany Railroad, and his father-in-law was president. And Richardson got lots of commissions for railroad stations. Uh, not all on the Boston and Albany. The uh, station in New London, Connecticut is a Richardson building and is absolutely spectacular. Uh, I don't have a picture to show you. Uh, Richardson's libraries were famous. And this one here at Quincy, the Crane Memorial Library, is very interesting. You'll notice again as you look at that, that the, uh, how important the building materials are that you're very conscious of the, of the building materials in this, uh, in this uh, uh, library. Uh, the decorative details are in the stone that was used for the building. Uh, there's just simply a, a, a round arch uh, and a round tower. 
but uh, and not a lot of embellishment uh, or applied design. The building to the, the uh, window to the right of the door is a typical Richardson uh, uh, window. He used that uh, design a great deal. We'll turn the page and we're going to finish this part up pretty quickly. Uh, I'll mention uh, the shingle style and I want you to see the picture at the top on page six, the house that Richardson built for Mrs. Stoughton uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, this was, house was considered a cottage. I think Mrs. Stoughton was a widow at this time and perhaps was the uh, mother of a friend of Richardson's. Uh, and this is a very beautiful house. It happens to be in one of the prime residential areas in this country, and I can assure you it is absolutely impeccably and beautifully preserved today. The front lawn has been replaced with a perennial garden that is gorgeous and uh, has all the pinks and blues and whites that look beautiful against the gray shingles. The interior of this house is all spectacular. It's also spectacular with wonderful antique furniture and modern art. Uh, I don't know who owns it, but it really is wonderful. And we will conclude here, uh, talking about Richardson, with the building on the bottom, which is very important because this was the uh, uh, wholesale store for Marshall Field in Chicago. And this is a building that really uh, influenced the Chicago School of Architecture that was developing at this time. This was Richardson's uh, he made two contributions in Chicago, but this is perhaps the larger one. And uh, Chicago architects looked at this and thought this was a magnificent building, massive, dignified, and simple. And uh, it served sort of as a model for many commercial buildings that were put up in this country afterward. Unfortunately, this building has been demolished. It's one of our architectural treasures that's gone. And uh, uh, it, 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 I'll say here it particularly influenced Lewis Sullivan, and we can't get too involved in that. That's another tangent in itself. But Lewis Sullivan was really the granddaddy of the art of uh, uh, art, uh, Chicago Architectural School. Uh, some people consider him the father of modern architecture. He's the man who said, form ever follows function. And uh, we won't get too involved with him right now, but we will say that this building made a great impression on Lewis Sullivan and had great influence on the Chicago School. And Chicago School was where the mastery of the steel frame uh, occurred and uh, great influence on American architecture. And Richardson, he wasn't part, he wasn't really modern, but he certainly was uh, close to being modern. I think, um, do any of you have any questions before I go on to the um, pictures of the kind of yeah. the I would characterize his architecture as massive. Uh, none of that necessarily came up in the style that you talked about tonight. I mean, or I haven't seen watching oh, well, arts, arts and Crafts in Queen Anne. Did, they seem more delicate to me than his stuff. Oh, he was an originator. Absolutely, and, and, and he's known for his beautiful work in, uh, in rough cut stone and boulders. No, I don't think you could ever consider anything that he did, either Arts and Crafts or Queen Anne, except uh, that he was influenced by some of the ideals of uh, respect for uh, building materials, respect for simplicity, respect for solid craftsmanship. Now, the shingle style, of course, that he did in the Watts Sherman House, uh, and also the Stoughton House in Cambridge, certainly reflect Queen Anne. And it's interesting that Richardson really did not run with Queen Anne. Uh, he kind of dropped that a little bit because after his fame uh, uh, with Trinity Church, he did very few designs for houses. He was so busy with public buildings that he couldn't fool with houses. And it was uh, uh, McKim, Mead, and White, um, uh, uh, Charles Fulham, McKim, and Stanford White, we all know in Pittsburgh, the guy who got shot, uh, uh, really carried on from Richardson's office with the development of, of Queen Anne and the shingle style. That became almost their trademark. Uh, no, but back to your original comment, Richardson was an innovator. There's no question about that. Yeah. 
I think I think you I think it's you know it's very hard to say who did what first. And I just was reading something that had absolutely it was it was music. It was Virgil Thompson saying, uh, talking about who influenced who is like talking about who caught cold from whom when everybody was standing in the same draft. And you're absolutely correct. But this to me, what Sherman House uh, was the monumental uh, publicity catching house that kind of introduced Queen Anne into this country. But he was not the first, uh, necessarily the first. Now, who, do you, who are you going to say is the first? I've forgotten, but I will Well, you know, again, the Queen Anne style, the name is very confusing and misleading. And certainly there were people in this country who were using shingles and bricks. Uh, uh, you know, that gets to be a hard thing, but I think, that, you know, I think that most of the architectural critics in their writing will say that the Watts Sherman House was a, a definite milestone in the uh, development of uh, uh, Queen Anne uh, architecture in the United States. Any other comments? Uh, let's come back. Can you talk about the arches a little bit? To the, the arches, mm -hmm. everywhere. Um, that's a neo-Romanesque kind of deal. The rounded arch was Romanesque, right? <coughs> and because the ancient Romans used that. Right. Uh, and again, we get back and who developed arches? I thought that arches were developed by the Romans, but no, they weren't. The arches were developed thousands of years ago, but they were popularized by the Romans. And the Romans used the, the rounded arch. Uh, the, in medieval times in our Western society, the pointed arch came into use and was an engineering advance because in a, the rounded arch, its span is, is set by the, uh, or the span sets the height of the arch. And in using a pointed arch, the span does not determine the height of the arch, so there's great flexibility when you use pointed arches, particularly in churches when you have transepts meeting uh, uh, the main body of the church. Uh, but uh, it's the, the rounded arch is the Romanesque. Does that answer your question? Right. Well, well, why would, uh, is it fair to say that that's a um, hallmark and trademark of uh, of Christian? One of them, uh, I think the, the things that, and I will not, I'll, I'll try to deal with that a little bit. Yes, he's, he's known for his, uh, certainly in the Allegheny County Courthouse and Jail, he was strongly influenced by Romanesque architecture and the rounded arch, There's, and no question about that. And the simplicity of the walls, we'll come to that. Uh, I guess that you can say that, but he, you know, when you look over here at the Ames Gate House and you look down here at the, a Robert Treat Payne house and other things that he did. You can see he just was a tremendously versatile person. But the Romanesque arch, yes. Oh, sure. And one more question. Why did he tend to use those in public buildings, like the courthouse, mm -hmm. the building in Buffalo, that's the mental institution, mm -hmm. the um, church in Boston, tended to use those in his public buildings, but not in his private buildings? Uh, he, he, uh, I, uh, I'm not sure, I am not sure that he, you mean in his houses is what you're speaking yeah. of. Uh, he did, he did relatively few houses, and I, you know, it's interesting, you can see here in the Stoughton house that there is a, a kind of a, a, a curved entrance. Yeah. Um, I, I'm trying to think. Um, he did use the rounded arches in the Glessner House in Chicago. Uh, but I'm, I will say that when Richardson uh, was at his peak, he was not doing much residential work. Let's see what we can do Uh, and uh, I, I 
swipe them to the eBay. This is the one good picture we have in Trinity Church. And again, uh, uh, to emphasize how much of the decorative detail is intrinsic to the structure of the church itself. Uh, uh, and there is a very, there are a lot of blank walls here. There's very little add on, although this is one of the busier, I think, one of the busier uh, pieces of his work. To refresh memory, here's Pittsburgh's first courthouse, uh, which was down on Market Square. <coughs> Uh, this is Pittsburgh's second courthouse, which was uh, built by John Chislett about 1840. Chislett was the first trained architect to practice in Pennsylvania, in Pittsburgh. He had been trained in England by the apprentice method and came here. And really, the only thing we have of his that, I, that survives, um, well, there's some buildings on the north side that are kind of nondescript, but the gate, the this, uh, the gate to uh, Allegheny Cemetery that is on Butler Street, that lovely piece of Victorian Gothic architecture, a uh, mm -hmm. really marvelous building. That is a Chislett building, or that is a uh, prime uh, uh, example of architecture here. The courthouse burned, and this was on the site of the present courthouse, burned in 1882, and this is a picture of the gutted building. And a competition then was set by the uh, county uh, for replacement of the courthouse. Uh, Richardson did not enter the competition. Uh, his health wasn't terribly good at this time. I mean, he uh, died just a few years later. He suffered from chronic kidney disease, uh, which we call Bright's disease at that time. Uh, I'm sure that uh, today he would have had dialysis and probably a kidney transplant and all that sort of thing. Gone on practicing for a number of years, uh, but that was not to be. Uh, but uh, Richardson had a friend uh, named Rickardson here, uh, John Rickardson in Pittsburgh, who was a classmate of his at Harvard and was a lawyer. And Mr. Rickardson said, say, I want you to enter the competition. And Richardson did and won the competition. The, uh, this is one of the best building pictures we have of the courthouse, oddly enough, because it was taken when uh, the land was being prepared for the city county building. And you can't see this anymore. The city county kind of building wants it. But um, Richardson um, uh, uh, won the competition. Construction was begun in 1884. The jail back here was finished in 1886, and Richardson died that year. The building was completed by three men in his office who formed the uh, firm of Shepley, uh, Rutan, and Coolidge. George Shepley was Richardson's son-in-law, and uh, uh, George Coolidge was his uh, brother-in-law, so he stayed in the family. And uh, they are the ones who were responsible for uh, finishing uh, the building with uh, Frank Alden, another architect who was here on site supervising construction. And I will talk about this to kind of clue you in if you're not familiar with how this building developed. The original building is what you see here that is in dirty, dirty stone with an entrance on what is now the second floor. And the same thing is true of the, of the jail. The original building is their dirty part. Uh, the jail and courthouse were built on Grants Hill. And Grants Hill was finally removed in 1913. And when Grants Hill was removed, uh, the basements of these two buildings were exposed. And it became, in fact, the ground floor. Uh, fortunately, uh, the quarry uh, in Massachusetts from which this granite came uh, was still existed. And uh, the foundation was covered with granite uh, and you can see that addition here as the fresh white stone. Uh, now if you go down and look at the jail of the city county building, you can't tell any difference between these uh, layers of stone, even though they were put on uh, decades apart. The this is, this is Pittsburgh dirt. Uh, it is, it is granite. 
I, I don't know. Has it been cleaned? Is, I'm not yes. an atheist. Yes. When was it cleaned? Um, uh, it was, uh, yes, I came here in 1966, and it has not been cleaned since I came here. Um, incidentally, what, the, the roof here is a really a brilliant orange uh, uh, tile that came from Ohio, but it's now so grimy and dirty uh, that it uh, you know, appears almost brown. And my understanding is that that's too fragile to clean. Is that your understanding? Other friends, more fruit. Uh -huh. Okay. Good. Thank you. <laughs> uh, at any rate, uh, it, it, I should mention now that the building is a brick building. Uh, it does have some iron beams in it, but I'm sure there are uh, wooden beams as well. Uh, it is faced with a veneer of granite, and that veneer is quite thick. You know, and today if you go out and veneer a house, you come out with something that, like this. Well, this this veneer is really really solid stuff. But the granite that you see is a veneer that has been applied to a basic brick structure. Uh, the original, uh, the building originally had this small terrace here. That, uh, the sidewalk was quite wide. You walked up a few steps to this terrace and then walked in the main doors. Uh, when Grants Hill was removed, new entrances were, the terrace was left, but new entrances were placed uh, in the basement level. And the building looked like this until about 1926 or 29, when Grant Street was widened. And when Grant Street was widened, the terrace went. And so uh, what we see uh, is this building, but devoid of the terrace here. And it's important to remember the little square windows that you see along here were basement windows originally, and now they are first floor windows. Oh, I guess I'd just like to come in here. When you look at this building, notice the its simplicity. Yes, the geometry is a little bit complicated with its cuboids and cylinders and cones and pyramids. But the building really is astonishingly simple. You're, you're conscious very much of the building material and the beautiful granite. But the detail work is really part of the fabric of the building. There's nothing that has been thrown on it, uh, you know, like the wedding cake. There's no icing here. My favorite iced building downtown is the uh, Art Building, if any of you know that, which is, it is, it is so awful, it's absolutely fabulous. I, 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 I look at that and I think, good gosh. But it is a building that is really iced. Wood. Wood and It's a what did you call it? Mix uh wine. Oh, the old wooden men's wine family. Yeah, I just know it was the art building. Yes. But fourth and wood. And it designed by Frederick Osterling. And um, it, you just gonna look at it, your, your jaw drops open. Yeah. Uh, uh, the object uh, of it, now that you think of it. The object of the union has one, and why is one more is that? The, the, the there's one, one the, the one across the street. I'm married, it's the Alden and Harlow, they must be thinking of. What's the Alden and Harlow building across the street? It's a, it's a bank building now, what's the name of it? It's what? No, that's, that's, a, that's a block. We won't, we won't get signed on that. But look, look at the simplicity of this building, which is, and the elegance, we're going to talk about this, the elegance of this tower. Uh, you know, simple lines, again, some Romanesque arches that have been filled in here, open here, uh, but very dignified. Note these towers at the back, which were ventilation towers, and I'll mention them later on. Oh, we, uh, well, yeah, yeah the, the, the whole Roman and no, Ro, no, Norman and Romanesque are yeah, well, but but you're you're you're, you're splitting hairs, kind of. Yes, uh, the, uh, the the Norman style was largely Romanesque. Do it. I didn't see it. I didn't see the copy. Of what, the tower? Yeah, I think we have a picture. Yeah, yeah you, you'll see lots of pictures. 
I just, well, this is a blurry picture, and I just show it to you to emphasize what, uh, uh, what a dignified presence that tower is on Grant Street. We have better pictures of the tower than we come to. Here's the nice one with the brick building in the background. The Bell Lane Tower is here. Spoke staff of the jail here. But just notice the beautiful simplicity of this, of this tower. <coughs> Did that tower have some kind of function? I mean, uh, it originally Richardson intended for this lower part of it to be storage for the county archives, oh. and that didn't work. It was inadequate. So my understanding is that the lower part of the tower is really uh, not used, and the tower therefore is totally decorative at this time. There was a there was a function I will mention. Um, Richardson, uh, when, uh, when he was in England, was kind of intrigued by the House of Westminster, the House of Parliament, and uh, he was intrigued, and that is not a, of course, I'm sure you're all aware, is not a medieval Gothic structure, it's a Victorian structure, and he was intrigued with the ventilating system that they had there, in which air was drawn in and sucked through the building and exhausted, and he thought that would be wonderful for Pittsburgh, so he planned the courthouse, these little round holes up here, which are called the nostrils in, uh, locally, uh, were the intake apertures for the ventilating system. And then the exhaust system was through these towers back here. It didn't work. It didn't store water up there. Another view of the uh, tower. Uh, we, this is a good uh, time. We're going to come to the courtyard here in just a minute. but. Uh, these are, there are four towers, small towers, in the, in the courtyard, and they contain the staircases. And remember that at the time that uh, this building was built, artificial light was uh, really uh, not ideal, and Richardson designed the staircases, so there, was, there were two exposures for light uh, and ventilation. Mm -hmm. Very nice, very nice idea. Another beautiful view which uh, emphasizes the simplicity of this building. Notice the beautiful stonework. Notice the architecture, the architectural detail that is part of the fabric of the building. The way the arches are constructed here, the position of the bouchoirs, that uh, the columns which are intrinsic to the building, and yes, do have sculptural detail, but are not add-ons. Uh, there, uh, we'll see some pictures of the beautiful detail work of this uh, string course here that goes. Mr. Garrett, you've got to get all of us on the field. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe I'll sit there. If you want the volume, you can sit there. And uh, uh, so you all get a look. Another final uh, view of. Uh, there's some other views, just to keep looking at this tower because it is so nice. This is my favorite view of the tower. And you can see, uh, again, the, uh, the beautiful craftsmanship of this, uh, this stonework. I can't answer that. Whether they, you know, they all, I, I'm sure that they were imported from one place and another, and I, I have no idea. And I'm not sure that my references will give us a specific answer. Uh, this is the present entrance to the uh, to the courthouse, <coughs> and it's important to remember that the initial entrance from that terrace would have been up here through what is now this window. Uh, and then when Grass Street was widened and the terrace was taken away, new entrances were really finished here in the basement by the architect, Roush, the city architect. He didn't try to duplicate Richardson, but he was trying to be sympathetic. There is almost um, an um, uh, uh, Art Deco kind of feel for this. The granite is a pretty good match. Uh, it's interesting that when the building was built, these lions stood at street level. When you walked into the entrance of the building, you were eyeball to eyeball with these lions, and they have been left in place. 
And notice, the, you know, granite is our hardest stone and very difficult to work. And this building is just full of this exquisite. Uh, this is new here, of course. But this up here is original. Uh, really exquisite workmanship. Uh, notice how uh, Richardson has kind of made the capital of the column blend in with the string course that goes along the wall. Uh, really interesting way to do it. This is, this is, this is new. This is 1929. I love this cockatrice. Another close up of the lion. And a final view, I think, of the uh, entrance as it is today. View of, uh, this is along of uh, Forbes. And uh, just again, the simplicity of the design and the beauty of the building materials. Uh, this, this is the Forbes Street uh, at the song again with the jail in the back. Uh, and, oh, I love the, these, these bases of these columns. Uh, some writer referred to them as Egyptian, but I have not been able to find anything in my picture books of Egypt that uh, I think you know, Richardson made this up. Uh, but these columns are, he used this base uh, a lot. These bases appear in Trinity Church in Boston. They appear in the Quincy Library that I, you have that rather poor picture of. And then notice how the three columns are fused with a, a single capital. A neat idea. And this again is the uh, still still on the Fort Street aspect. When the building was originally constructed, this arch led into the courtyard. But when the uh, street was lowered, it was uh, felt that it would be desirable to fill in this upper part of the arch with this glass window to enable communication from this side to this side without going up and down stairs. So this is not original to Richardson. Again, uh, oh, a little dragon sitting over here. It's fun to look for the animals. Uh, beautiful. Arches, the beautiful arch, the way they use. The detail in the cell door. Is that the fifth act of your sign? I think we're still on the fourth street side. But there is no, there's no icing on this cake. There, yes. That, that looks so much like a Roman aqueduct. You know, oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Was he in Italy also? Did he visit Italy? I, I'm not sure that he got that. He certainly did not get <coughs> that far south on his, uh, in his student days. And I'm not sure that he got that, that they ever got to Italy. But of course, again, those arches you see in Aqueducts, we got up into France as well, and we're back into the into the Romanesque uh, uh, influence in France. It was very dramatic. Uh, we were going to the Brittany and that part of France, and then we stumbled the song in my action. Anyway. These fails are just about as decorative as he gets as far as that on the concerned. But anyway, uh, the dragon here, beautiful carving in the dragon. We'll say a little bit about the courthouse. This is the plan uh, uh, with the central court. The, uh, the courtrooms here and chambers for the judge and the staff uh, between each courtroom. Uh, there were, uh, these are the towers with the staircases and the elevator shafts. Uh, the building was constructed with elevator shafts, but elevators were not installed. Uh, I'm not sure when the elevators were installed, and I'm not sure why there was a delay, but there was a delay of several years. Whether they were waiting for the elevators to be developed, or whether there was some problem with money, I have no idea. Always kind of interesting. Uh, speaking of money, I, uh, this whole project cost a bit over $2 million. <laughs> 
Uh, now, really, most writers would say, now, to do something in today's world, you should multiply by at least 25. So let's say it was a $50 million project. It still seems like a pretty good bargain to me. I've just been reading uh, the biography of Andrew Mellon, and it was kind of fun because Judge Mellon was on council when the courthouse and jail were built, and he was violently opposed to this extravagance, thought it was a waste of money, entered two lawsuits to uh, try to stop the project. One lawsuit got to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and was dismissed, and the project continued. It was just kind of an interesting aside. Uh, but uh, I think the, the county got a great bargain in this. Uh, this is the courtyard when it was a parking lot. But here are these wonderful staircases. That was the wonderful play of arches. In, if you really want to see the play of arches, it's essential that you go into the courtyard. Mm -hmm. it's, it's wonderful. And here's the courtyard today. It's a delightful spot, very much used, especially for breaks. A lot of people brown bag their lunches here. And uh, it's, it's, it's one of Pittsburgh's delightful kind of private spaces. Uh, these are the ventilation towers that were unsuccessful. They were added to the staircase tower. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I think, the Ross Street entrance. Uh, the ironwork is very beautiful. It's all by Samuel Yellen. Yes. That entrance is exactly like the Besser House uh, yes. in Chicago. Yes. 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 And I, 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 and I don't have any pictures, uh, but I was going to mention it. Uh, this the, this ironwork is by Samuel Yellen uh, of Philadelphia, one of the great iron masters in this country. Did a lot of the ironwork at the Cathedral of Learning, even, and I think his studio is still uh, his his granddaughter or great granddaughter still runs it, and they still turn out beautiful ironwork. But this is all Samuel Yellen. So go to the inside uh, to the grand staircase, which is which is the real center of the building is aesthetically, and the arches here are wonderful. This is all limestone, not granite, but limestone, but marble bases here. These are original fixtures. Uh, this is the view as you enter from, uh, and come up the stairs from uh, Grant Street uh, and look toward the courtyard. And here are those original fixtures. This is going up the staircase. And you, when you look and you see the play of all these arches, it really is it's, it's, it's quite a beautiful sight, the staircase again. Uh, I'm going to show you this door right here next. And this is the door that, to the law library. And the law library is closed, and uh, the space has been divided. I don't think it was of great architectural significance, but the space provided was not adequate for a modern law library, and they quickly outgrew it. And I'm not sure where the law library is now. Uh, the ninth yeah. floor of the city county. This is ninth floor of city county. Right. Never been there. To what extent is this stonework a facade? Excuse me. To what extent is this stonework a facade? And to what extent is it a structure? Well, I, I, the, the building is brick, and so I assume that in the interior stonework is a veneer, just like the external is, because, well, the building is essentially a brick building. And so uh, I, I assume that this is a, a stone finish. Uh, but notice the beautiful woodwork here. Uh, and uh, here is the memorial to Henry Hobson Wilson <coughs> that has been inscribed here. Uh, notice the beautiful capitals here and how they're fused, and of, of a, a non-traditional, non-classic uh, design. This is kind of nice. This is Henry Hudson Richardson's monogram, uh, H, H, and then the R's. I don't think that Richardson planned that. I would seriously doubt it. I think his son-in-law and brother-in-law, when they were finishing the building, uh, added this monogram as sort of his uh, staff. <coughs> Another view of the staircase. Uh, we'll mention a little bit about the bridge of size. Um, this, of course, does not resemble the bridge of size at all, but we call it the bridge of size because, like the bridge of size, it connected the court 
room <coughs> with the jail and prisoners room there across here, and presumably in Pittsburgh they side just as uh, much as they side in Venice. Uh, notice the, uh, the beautiful archway here again. This is the area here, which has an interesting fenestration, is the old warden's house. Uh, when the, my understanding is that when the jail was built, there was some sort of a statute that said the warden had to live on the premises. And so this was a very nice house that was constructed for the warden. Uh, it has had a little bit of a change that has changed, uh, it has made it look quite different. I think it looked a little more inviting, perhaps, when the street level was up here. Uh, in the original construction, this was a small window, and the door was up higher. And then when the, street, the hill was taken away, the street was lowered, this window was made full to match these, and the door was lowered down. You come into the, really the basement of this house and climb a staircase to the main floor. Uh, I've been in the house uh, when it was, uh, before it was renovated this last time, and it really is a very comfortable house, there's no question. The central rotunda here is the landmark of the jail. Uh, this is the way the jail was laid out. Here's the door. This is the bridge of size, Wall Street, uh, the entrance of the rotunda, and the original cell blocks. These became inadequate, and in 1908, Frederick Osterling, a local architect who was very versatile, could work in any style he wanted. He designed the Arab building, and I'm sure that its wedding cake uh, appearance is because the client wanted it. I, I, I don't think it necessarily came from Osterling, but when Osterling was asked to enlarge the jail, he followed Richardson so beautifully that it, it is almost seamless. You cannot tell where Osterling uh, uh, begins and Richardson ends. But when Osterling did the uh, uh, additions in 1908, this lot was added to, and the jail was extended a bit this way with the tower. Uh, this block was extended, and another block was inserted in here. These black spaces were exercise yards for the prison. Uh, this gives some idea of, there's the rotunda, the bridge of size. Uh, some of the gates, uh, a cell block, cell block, cell block. Uh, the uh, Osterling, Osterling's addition is from this tower to this tower. This is the original. Uh, you cannot see the diagonal that was added. This is a receiving, uh, a kind of bad picture. The other exercise yards are much more attractive and have been made into carpets. This is the building in, building's interior now. Originally, these were all cell blocks. And uh, it was very depressing. It was, it was absolutely awful. Uh, terrible, unthinkable. But it has been renovated into office space for the uh, uh, family court and been done very sympathetically, very beautifully, very nicely done. We can be proud of that. Michael? Marion, do you know who did that? And I, 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 in fact, I've even, no, talked, I don't. I've even talked to the architect who did it, and I can't remember his name. I'm sorry. Who? IKM. 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 And what, what does that stand for? You know, uh, well, it's what, 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 Love this. One of the most beautiful smoke sacks. Uh, this wonderful wall. There's the gate down there. Lousy picture, and it's, it, it's out of focus, but pull it in anyway because it does give you, gives you the effect of this uh, 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 arched uh, gateway and the beautiful masonry here. And as you say, the Gusser House in Chicago has got that. This level, did that level change or is that the same? The, the, the <coughs> interior here, or just the, the amount of gates above the street? A little bit, as you can see went from that picture, but not as much as on the Grant Street. The, the maximum change was on the Grant Street. 
And then as you got further and further posterior, it became less and less. I think it was rather minimal here. The interior now, just a park, but also quite popular. We'll close by just mentioning the one other building that uh, Richardson designed in Pittsburgh, and this is an annual church on the north side. And just a little jewel of the church. Uh, notice the simplicity, <coughs> rounded arches, beautiful masonry, and uh, this shows up very well here. Uh, you can see the, pa the patterns in which the brick has been laid different here from here. Uh, and I mean, we won't dwell on this because that other picture shows the same thing. Uh, this is uh, the posterior of the church, called the Bake Oven Church, because it looks something like an oven. Uh, the rectory, uh, this is, this is an awful lot, but the rectory, kind of nice, and well maintained. And this is the rectory from the front with the little garden. You walk in on the side here, and the uh, rector and his family live right here. This, I, I'll go on to talk about Richardson's influence for just a second. Here, but uh, you all know this house, Sunny Ledge on uh, Fifth Avenue. This is not designed by Richardson. Uh, it was designed by uh, Alexander Wadsworth Longfellow, uh, the poet's nephew, who worked in Richardson's office. And it was built, he left Richardson about the time Richardson died, and I can't tell you, keeping track of. Architects moving from firm to firm is as bad as keeping track of lawyers who move from firm to firm. And, but uh, 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 Longfellow had left Richardson at the time this house was completed, but it's pure Richardson. Uh, notice the, the uh, simplicity of the design, the asymmetry, the round tower, the room. Mm -hmm. uh, beautiful brickwork, beautiful doors. And I can't tell you what these hinges are, but I wonder if they are not Samuel Yellow as well. Gorgeous. Another important landmark in Pittsburgh that is Richardsonian uh, is the Shadyside Presbyterian Church, which was finished about three years after Richardson's death and was designed by Richardson's son-in-law and brother-in-law, uh, Sheffield and Dan Coolidge. Uh, in certain ways, I like it almost better than Trinity Church because it is simpler. It, uh, it shows many of the design features of the Alameda County <coughs> Courthouse in, in its simplicity and attention to detail of the fabric. This is an Austerling building, the Times Building downtown on 4th Avenue, uh, 1891, I think. Uh, and when you look at this, it looks like Richardson's uh, a warehouse in Chicago. Only just a little slice of it. Uh, this, uh, many people feel, is Pittsburgh's first skyscraper. Skyscraper being steel frame building with elevators. Uh, but this, this, gosh, this is very rich and uh, This is certain. This gorgeous entrance here uh, is uh, very rich and subtle. So, uh, even though Austrian designed the Arab building like a wedding cake, he could also design something like that. Uh, First Methodist Church, designed by a firm from Akron, Ohio. East Liberty Presbyterian Church. I mean, uh, no. yeah, I mean, no. uh, East Minster Presbyterian Church on Highland Avenue. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It was very glad. Yes, they've just finished cleaning this. And it, it, it's very nice, but, you know, it's not quite as restrained as the tower of, of the courthouse, but you can see the Richardson here. This is a bad picture, but I'm going to show it anyway, uh, because you can get the idea of Pennsylvania Station. If, if you read the Post-Gazette today, um, uh, Mrs. Lowry had this uh, a wonderful little article about um, uh, Daniel Hudson Burnham, and it's kind of fun to read. I like her. She, uh, she writes well, and she has uh, a good eye, and it was kind of fun. When you look at the block here, uh, this is 1989, uh, you can see how closely it resembles uh, the uh, Marshall Field Warehouse in Chicago. But D.H. Burnham, as Patricia Lowry said, was still tied up in the Beaux-Arts movement. And when he got this built, he could not resist decorating it. And when you go down, uh, 
you, when you go down and look at this close, you can't see it in the picture. There are cartouches and, and garlands and stuff all over this building in terracotta. And I guess that's not too bad. Uh, certainly, uh, Burnham did leave us with this rotunda, which is all those are, not Richardson at all, um, but is a marvelous piece of architecture. It's our finest example of those are architecture in the city and is uh, recognized as a national landmark. Uh, it, is, it is absolutely wonderful. I'm sure if Richardson saw this, he would just kind of uh, uh, smiled and shrugged his little shoulders and thought, well, you know, what can you do? <laughs> um, uh, that kind of uh, concludes the side. So, uh, do you have you have any questions that I can answer? I'm not an architect. I'm not an architectural historian. I, I'll do my best. I'm interested in this. Um, architecture kind of goes with the territory of plastic surgery. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Patty Hughes has, has found us a speaker who's going to play bagpipes and talk about the history of bagpipes. In July, David Finoli, who has written a book for Arcadia on the pirates, is going to come and talk on the pirates. It's a, it's a home game night, but we want to keep our Tuesday schedule. Special treat, if the Pirates are winning at the time, we'll have a TV and you can watch them. Uh, in the fall, we have the schedule in the back, but our, our schedule is actually fit, fixed till the end of the, till December. We're going to have a discussion of the cable cars of Pittsburgh. We're going to start in September with the coal mine tunnels under Squirrel Hill. We'll talk about a difference from Mr. Richardson. And uh, we'll go from there. Thanks for coming. Don't feel like you have to rush out. You can sit and chat. Yeah. Good night. There are some nice